Sam um, is, of course, the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The End of Faith, and Letter to a Christian Nation. Um, he's a graduate in philosophy from Stanford University, I believe, studying with, with Dick Rorty, the late Richard Rorty, who was going to come to this meeting last year, but sadly was claimed by pancreatic cancer. And uh, Sam is, <laughs> well, it says here, completing a doctorate in neuroscience. But I talked to Marco Iacoboni last night, and I'm not sure how long that's going to take. So. <laughs> Sam Harris. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm, uh, it's, an, it's an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, Dan Dennett and I were at a meeting of atheists, an atheist convention actually, about a month ago. And um, I had the good sense at that meeting to stand up in front of 500 of the most committed atheists in the country and say that atheism as a philosophy was bankrupt uh, and as a word uh, was uh, disastrous and we should not use the term. Um, this had more or less the effect that any social scientist in this room could have warned me about. Uh, <laughs> I think this was the only talk I had ever been to that began with a standing ovation and ended with something, some scarcely mammalian sounds of disgruntlement. Um, incidentally, Dan's talk began with a standing ovation and ended with one, and I noticed that that conduces to a better mood later in the evening. Uh, anyway, Roger asked me to, to brief, briefly summarize my uh, misgivings with the concept of atheism and also talk a little bit about what my experience has been since our last meeting as I have spent much of that time spreading joy to the world by publicly criticizing religion. Um, my concern with the use of the term atheism, and here I'm going to echo something that Michael Shermer said, uh, is that it's, it invites a variety of misunderstandings and it's, and it's philosophically really without content. I mean, we, we don't need a word like atheist. In the same way, we don't need a word for somebody who's not an astrologer. And we simply do not call people non-astrologers. And I don't think we would be tempted to if astrology suddenly became ascendant in our society. All we need are words like reason and evidence and common sense and bullshit to put astrologers in their place. And, and so it could be with religion. Now, my point with the, with the term atheism, or really any label, naturalist, skeptic, humanist, secular humanist, bright, is that it, it invites misunderstandings and unnecessarily trims down our constituency. Because the truth is, on any specific question, a, a majority of people, even in America, functionally reject religious thinking. I mean, you take a question like, and this is from sexual ethics to medical research, you take something like embryonic stem cell research. A majority of Americans already reject the authority of religion on this subject. And so, so most, most people, uh, many, many more people than would ever answer to the name of atheist, uh, see on any specific question that there is a, a conflict between science and religion. I'm sure many of you in this audience are, are functionally atheists and yet would never dream of going to an atheist conference or blogging on an atheist website. Uh, so it seems to me that if we want to encourage public displays of rationality, rallying people to the banner of atheism, or, or any banner that suggests that we are a maligned and marginal and cranky interest group, uh, is a bad strategy. Now the concept of atheism and, the, and this designation of, of the new atheist that is following many of us around like our shadows, uh, has confused, I think, even the scientific discussion of religion. And I think much of that confusion has been in evidence at this conference. Uh, it's in evidence in a debate that we're having online right now. Thomas Nagel is, is saying what many people at this conference have, have said, that there is no, uh, there's nothing about science that entails a criticism of religion. And there's nothing about science that entails a commitment to atheism. This, I think, is to be misled by words words like religion and atheism. I mean, science clearly does not entail that one identify oneself as an atheist or even think of oneself as an atheist. But science does entail that one be skeptical of unsupported and unsupportable claims about miracles and about the divine origin of certain books. 
And when you dig into the details, this is all atheism is. Atheism is the failure to be convinced by other people's claims about miracles. And it is the conviction that they too should not be convinced. I mean, is, is there a conflict between justified and unjustified belief? I mean, this is really where we can see that there's a zero-sum game here between religion and science, because both religion and science are ways of forming beliefs, or way, way, ways of, they, are, they are, are systems of belief and their justification, or, or lack thereof. And unfortunately, they are systems that require very different standards of evidence and levels of self-criticism. And, and therefore, any comparison between religion and science is bound to be invidious. Another problem, another way in which this, this, this entanglement is unavoidable between religion and science is that you can't disentangle religious and scientific truth claims. The belief that Jesus was born of a virgin is one of the, the key doctrines of Christianity. It is also a claim about biology. The belief that he will return to earth at some point in the future to judge the world entails a variety of claims about history, about the human survival of death, and apparently about the, the mechanics of human flight without the aid of technology. These are, there is of necessity conflict between religion and science here. Now, now people like Deidre McCluskey have alleged that, that the atheist criticism of religion always focuses on the most benighted and marginal and Bible-thumping you know, nitwit version of the faith. And there's a far more sophisticated faith on offer that is untouched by this criticism. It's just not true. I mean, this criticism applies every bit as much to a sophisticated believer like Francis Collins. In fact, more so, because he should know better. Uh, he should know that, see, that if a frozen waterfall can testify to the divinity of Jesus, anything can testify to anything. Now, what, so whatever the subject under discussion, there are good reasons for believing things, and there are bad reasons. And the problem here is that religion has made bad reasoning into an art form. And if, if there is something worth discussing in the experience of a Buddha or a Jesus, as I think there is, I think there really is a there there, I think it is possible to have a rare and beautiful and transformative experience. And we can call that spirituality or mysticism. If there's something worthy of discussion there, it should be susceptible to rational inquiry. And, and, and we can hold mystics and contemplatives to the highest standards of empirical rigor and logical coherence. It's simply a myth to say that we can't. And many believers, as, as you know, have taken refuge in Stephen Jay Gould's I think, quizzling formulation of non-overlapping magisteria, the idea that, that religion, and faith, religion and science cannot be in conflict because they represent two different domains of expertise. Well, let's see how this works. Okay, science represents the, the best authority on the workings of the physical universe. Religion represents the best authority on what exactly? The non-physical universe? Probably not. What about meaning and values and ethics and the good life? Well, here is another myth. The idea that scientific rationality has nothing prescriptive to say about morality and human happiness. I mean, science, we are told, can help us get what we value, but it cannot tell us what we ought to value. I mean, many of us believe that we can, we can scan people's brains while they make a variety of moral judgments, but will never be in a position to say what judgments they should have made. That is, what judgments are, are ethically normative. This is a myth, and, and we, we have exported this mythology to the culture at large. Uh, and now most people think that they are offered a, for, a forced choice between the law of God and something like moral relativism. And a, as a result, most people, even most scientists and secularists, have ceded all discussion about meaning and values and morality 
to the care of theologians and religious apologists, more or less without argument. And this, this, has, this is what has kept religion in such good standing, even while its authority has been battered and nullified on every other question of significance. Now, I'm convinced this has been a huge mistake, intellectually first, but also politically, morally, even spiritually. Now, once we understand human happiness, uh, once we understand morality as, as being inextricable from happiness, not just human happiness, but, but the, the difference between happiness and suffering in conscious creatures like ourselves, then we see that there will be, it will be susceptible to empirical inquiry and rational discussion. Inquiry and rational discussion. I mean, are there objective facts to be known about the causes of human happiness? Surely there must be. I mean, it does not seem too soon to say that love is generally better than hate and compassion better than cruelty. I mean, it may be a very long time, as anyone in this room can appreciate, before we fully understand the basis for the deepest psychological well-being in terms of genes and social structures and economic systems. Uh, but it is not too soon to say that something like honor killing doesn't figure prominently in it. I mean, and notice that, that this makes realists of, of us morally, uh, functional realists. And, and, and there, does, there does not have to be right, narrow right answers to every moral question for us to be realists. I mean, the, the, the difference between right and wrong can be like the difference between food and poison. You know, there's, there's, not, there's not one right food. There's not one best food. But th that does not obviate all distinction between food and non-food. Uh, we, we can have a, it's quite possible that, that at the end of the discussion, 10,000 years from now, we will have a, a, a band of moral, morally appropriate, which is to say, behaviors and thoughts conducive to, to the deepest human happiness. Uh, uh, in any given situation, it'll be like food as opposed to poison. Now, many scientists and many, many of you in this room are going to be quick to say that science does not yet have much to say about how to best to maximize human happiness. And this is true. But what special competence does a rabbi or imam or priest have on this subject? What special competence does a religious expert have on the subject of whether or not embryonic stem cell research or preventative war or family planning are moral? I think the answer is none. I mean, the truth is, uh, under, understanding a scriptural tradition is no more relevant to questions of ethics than it is to questions of astronomy. I mean, what, what our, the representatives of, of our various religions can tell us what their congregations believe on a wide variety of topics and believe almost invariably on bad evidence. They can tell us what their holy books say you ought to believe in order to escape the fires of hell. But what they can't do, or can do no better than butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, is they, is they can't say why these injunctions are ethical. Is it ethical to kill a person for changing his religion? Now, I would bet my life that the answer to that question is no. Which is to say, I would bet my life that killing people for apostasy is a bad strategy for maximizing human well-being. As it turns out, however, if you poll British Muslims ages 16 to 24, 36 percent of them disagree with me and think that people should be killed for leaving their faith. These, these are British Muslims. As it turns out, they're on firm ground, theologically speaking. The, the Quran does not explicitly say that apostates should be killed. But the Hadith does, the sacred literature of the Hadith does, repeatedly and without equivocation. Is this edict ethical? Is it compatible with a civil society? Is the, is the reliance upon authority that has brought this barbarism